Here we go. Okay. In theory, everything's working. We should be live. Uh, sure, I've got all of my tools available. Where's my... What? There it is. Okay. My chat. Okay. Excellent. Uh, how's it going? Great. Thank you. Um, so the question I always ask people, uh, who are you? What do you do? Hey, I'm Hamsa Padmanathan. I'm an astrophysicist and cosmologist uh, at the University of Geneva at the Department of Theoretical Physics. And I hold an independent grant uh, for leading my own project on various topics in cosmology and astrophysics. So let's talk about just give people sort of an understanding of, of what your background is and, and what you work on. So tell us sort of your, your educational pathway. Okay, so I did my PhD in India, followed by a Tamala Fellowship at the um, ETH in, in Zurich, mm -hmm. which is also in Switzerland. And following that, I was in Canada for a couple of, of one and a half years at CETA, the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. And from there, I came to my current position, which is at the University of Geneva. And what did you specialize in as you were as you were working on your various stages of your of your education? Well, so um, before I did my PhD, I was majoring in physics. So I did my um, bachelor's and master's in India. Um, incidentally, I got the gold medal in both for topping in all subjects in the college and university, after which I joined Ayuka, which is the place where I did my PhD. Uh, and uh, that PhD was essentially a PhD in physics, but there is, um, it's focused on astrophysics. So I was studying essentially topics on cosmology and realization, some of the things which we'll be discussing now. And uh, after that, uh, everything has been on, the work I'm doing has been all on this, um, on cosmic dawn, as well as several topics on the cosmic microwave background, and um, also on the later time line of the universe, which is uh, the epoch of realization and uh, you know, coming towards the present universe right. and how we can probe it in the most uh, interesting way. So, so let's talk about just the the timeline of the universe. Um, people are, are are fairly familiar, I think, with the Big Bang leading up to the cosmic microwave background radiation. But 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 from that point forward, people are fairly. Uh, it maybe doesn't doesn't get a lot of of press. Maybe Pe people don't talk about it a lot. But there is this sort of really interesting sequence of events as as cosmologists have have figured it out so far. Can you sort of give us the the overview of the beginning of the universe? Sure. So the universe started out. We actually don't know. It requires the kind of bringing together of the models of gravity and quantum theory, which a lot of very smart people are still working on, and we kind of call it the Big Bang just as a name, you know, we just we don't understand what happened exactly at zero. But following that, um, it's, it's pretty, you know, right from a few billions of a second, everything is very well known. And that's really a testimony to our laws of physics and the way we understand them so well. And that's helping us to describe our entire universe for, for, for a 13.7 billion year time scale. And what is really interesting is that um, uh, just following the Big Bang, it is believed that the universe went through a rapid phase of expansion, which is known as inflation, and following which we had the period when radiation was dominant and then became the period when matter, like not just the matter which we kind of are familiar with, the baryons and the kind of protons, electrons, so on, but also dark matter, which is the the stuff which we kind of know exists, but we don't see and interact with, and it's it interacts very weakly with the radiation, and uh, you know uh, it it just interacts gravitationally. So both of this matter, as well, uh, started dominating, and this is very close to the period when, as the universe was expanding, 
you had its temperature kind of decreasing because you expect that, right? Something very hot, very dense, and then it's expanding and then you've got its temperature kind of coming down. And uh, what happened at a uh, very close to this time when matter and radiation were about equal was that the protons and electrons sort of came together to form hydrogen. So hydrogen just has one proton, one electron. And before that, the protons and electrons were in this hot soup, They're completely coupled to radiation, the com completely coupled to the ambient, uh, you know, electromagnetic uh, uh, sort of essentially to the photons, which are the which are which is what is making the uh, the light, the radiation. Whereas just after that, they decoupled. So what what they did was they just they just they just went their own way. The light went its own way, and we see that light right now as what is known as the cosmic microwave background. What happened just after that is what is very exciting because it's called the dark ages. Dark ages because apart from this initial light, which was uh, left over, let's say, from the Big Bang, there was no other source of light. So the first stars hadn't formed, galaxies haven't formed, all the beautiful stuff you see on your uh, on your screen behind you had it, it wasn't there. And we only had the, uh, the neutral gas, essentially neutral hydrogen, and a little bit of helium and other things which formed uh, at early stages. And now, uh, essentially, this is known as the dark ages because there is no other source of light. And the universe was kind of, you know, just waiting in some sense for the first luminous sources to kind of light it up and usher in a new, a new phase. And this is precisely what happened at cosmic dawn. So the cosmic dawn did two things. The first thing was it brought sources of light because what happened was all this gas started forming stars and um, you know they, it, it also interacted with the dark matter halos. So it, it kind of fell into the dark matter halos, formed stars, and you had all these pinpricks of light lighting up the, the whole of the dark universe. And when you had that happening, you also had um, the, these, these very stars, these very early galaxies, uh, to which kind of brought in a new phase. So the thing is, at up to now, the gas, it was all in gaseous form, it was all in hydrogen, and that hydrogen was neutral. But now this, what this light went and did was it turned back the hydrogen back into protons and electrons. So you have a, you kind of have what happened before happening again. So that's why it's called reionization. Mm -hmm. that when the entire universe got turned back into protons and electrons, which happened about a billion years after the Big Bang. It was the end of reionization. And today, from that 1 billion to 13 billion, so for 12 billion years, we're living in an almost completely reionized universe, almost to the level of one part in 100,000, one part in 10,000 to 100,000. So out of every one 10,000 hydrogen, only one is neutral. Right. And so, you know, I always think about this, you know, when you sort of think about it visually, imagining the like shortly after the cosmic microwave background radiation, you know, I, I did the math at one point, like the temperature was like a dull red star, like a so when that light was finally able to be released, it's like the whole universe was just one you know, uh, red dwarf colored star, and then this light was able to escape and it's been traveling all this time to us. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the first sort of cosmological things we were able to see because it was everywhere. And it was essentially, all the radiation was there. Why is that that next phase? As you say that the dark ages, why has that been so tricky to be able to detect? Yeah, so the main thing about seeing this first, you know, this first neutral gas, this first dark ages, the first important thing is that there are no stars. By definition, the first stars haven't formed yet, galaxies haven't formed yet. So you do not have access to all the, you know, photographs literally you can take of the galaxies and stars by uh, as what you can do like what you can do in the later later time like you can really image those galaxies and stars. you don't have access to that what you do have access to is the gas and that's a very good uh, point here which actually leads us to probably what we'll be discussing next because 
this gas is um, is hydrogen is mostly hydrogen it's the dominant component and it it emits in the radio band it emits in a very specific frequency there's a spin flip transition yeah let's talk about that uh, which, which is uh, interesting which of the hydrogen and it takes place at 21 centimeter wavelength yeah. Now, many people in the chat and uh, and in the audience would recognize this kind of wavelength as being bang on what kind of emission you or you you are used to in radio frequencies, in the actual radios which you listen to and so on. So most of the signal, most of the kind of uh, most of the things we're trying to access are emitting at a place which is plagued by other emissions mm -hmm. like foregrounds so not only that you have these radios which are you know everything emitting radio on the earth is going to interfere but a lot more of the interference comes because you have a lot of um a lot of emission from our own galaxy which is about ten thousand times stronger than the signal which this this early gas is emitting and which we want to see. Right. So, so let's talk about the actual mechanism that's going on. So you talked about this idea of this spin flip, the 21 centimeter line. Can you explain sort of what's actually going on that allows astronomers to peer into this into this region? What is actually causing these radio waves to be emitted by these giant clouds of hydrogen? Yeah, so, uh, right. So this, um, if you have a lot of gas, essentially most of the gas, um, if you're talking about just during cosmic dawn or just before cosmic dawn, you're talking about the gas, which is between galaxies, not, and uh, because firstly, there are no galaxies and then there's everything is just gas. And otherwise you have a lot of gas in what is known as the intergalactic medium, which is just the space between these first very early uh, star forming galaxies. Uh, most of it is hydrogen and hydrogen has, uh, as I said, the proton and the electron. And um, essentially what takes place here is that depending on whether the spins, which is something, um, which is essentially a property which is used in quantum mechanics to describe the state of this proton and this electron, the two spins of the proton electron could be aligned or they could be anti-parallel, which is one pointing one way, the other pointing the opposite way. So depending on which of the two states the hydrogen is, it can sort of jump between these two states. So if you jump between a state which has them, you know, up to down, you are going to emit radiation, emit light, corresponding to the energy difference between these two states, because the two states are separated by an energy which manifests itself in the light that's coming out of it in the kind of you know in the kind essentially in the radio light which is coming out of this uh, right. this atom and that has a frequency of uh, that has a frequency about a 1.4 gigahertz which is uh, like 21 centimeter or just in the radio band so that's why you get the signal from the hydrogen <clears throat> but as you said the there's still enormous amounts of hydrogen of this neutral hydrogen throughout the entire universe, even here in the Milky Way that hasn't been turned into stars yet. But, but I'm assuming that the the wavelength that it emits is redshifted the farther it is away from us as the observer. Absolutely. But it's also dimmer because it's farther away and there's less of it to see. Absolutely, on both counts. So people have studied this, our galaxy and neighboring galaxies in this 21 centimeter from a long time ago. It's been routinely used by people to study, you know, the gas and what it's doing and very, at very high resolution, you can get these beautiful images in this. But as you go further away from, um, you know, from today, uh, as you probably know, cosmologists are a very lucky species uh, because we have this incredible ability to observe the past. Mm -hmm. uh, if I look at something here, it is, uh, I'm not seeing it as it is right now. I'm seeing it as it was about a billionth of a second or very, very small fraction of a second before because light takes that much time for to travel from it to me. And so similarly, if I look at something, which is someone who's standing, let's say a light year away, I will see them as they were last year. I wouldn't see them as they are today. And indeed, because of this, uh, this property, 
the further and further we look back, the earlier and earlier on in the universe we're able to see. And this is something which we, we use to get to the epoch of this dark ages and cosmic dawn and all these exciting, exciting frontiers. And indeed, as you say, when things are coming to us like this 21 centimeter or any kind of light, it gets stretched by the expansion of the universe and it gets kind of multiplied by a factor which is equivalent to the amount of expansion the universe has done in the mm -hmm. intervening time. So you're, so you're absolutely right that detecting this requires this combination of going to a very high wavelength because it's not gonna be in our backyard anymore and also getting to a very high sensitivity because you also want to detect the signal which is so faint and coming from the earliest epochs. And and that, I mean, each of those is a challenge on its own. And so you, in order to be able to observe the longest wavelengths mm -hmm. at the faintest visibility requires yeah. very special tools. So let's talk a little bit about the, the new telescopes that are being developed to be able to reveal this this period of time yeah um so as you uh, mentioned there are uh, at least two or three major efforts and a huge number of pathfinder efforts so kind of you know precursors to these efforts and um, broadly they cover three regimes and uh, if you think about it in a multi-messenger context four regimes so i will just uh, divide the time into kind of explaining all four sure so the first one is radio so we know that as we just were discussing you have this 21 centimeter you have this gas which is emitting a lot of um, a lot of radiation and you want to look at it at these very very low frequencies and uh, access epochs like the cosmic dawn and the square kilometer array, for example, is a planned effort in Australia and uh, South Africa, which is, by the way, just started construction this year. And this is something which is going to go out and see, um, you know, look at um, how these first galaxies formed. It's going to access cosmic dawn. It's going to access the reionization epoch and all the later period as well. So that's uh, that's one of the things the SKA will do. In the in this is in the band of the radio. Uh, if you come to slightly different bands, then in the band of the, there's a band called submillimeter, which again, I explain, uh, I, I spend a lot of time in my paper, and also it's a very exciting band for um, future surveys, and we are re we're really on the brink of making major discoveries in this band. This band lies between our visible electromagnetic uh, radiation, so that the things which we are, you know, seeing the optical band, so to speak, the visible light, and the radio band. And this band uh, is kind of what the kind of things which um, emit at these frequencies are star forming galaxies, stars, and star mm -hmm. forming systems. What they do is around them, normally, you'll find a lot of molecular material molecules because most of the stars are forming due to molecular hydrogen so it's not really atomic hydrogen which directly forms stars it converts itself into molecular hydrogen and that is the main fuel for star formation unfortunately you cannot detect molecular hydrogen easily because it doesn't have a dipole moment what is known as a it, it's very symmetric so such a molecule is hard to see Hmm. And what is very nice is that uh, the carbon monoxide, which is another molecule, it is the second most abundant molecule after this molecular hydrogen, is the one which is um, very easy to detect in place of molecular hydrogen. Oh. And it also acts as a tracer of molecular hydrogen in some sense, because wherever the hydrogen is, you'd expect to find this. That's why carbon monoxide has become our go-to, um, you know, um, go-to species for thinking oh, about the scales, the scales which govern star formation. We already knew this in, again, our own galaxy. We already knew this when we were looking at, let's say, the time when we were looking at 21 centimeter from our own galaxy and so on. We also were looking at carbon monoxide in the local um, universe, but now it's become very, very possible to do carbon monoxide and these kind of um, these kind of substances at high redshifts, at 
early times at early uh, at the time when let's say the cosmic dawn uh, cosmic dawn is a little tricky because at that time the stars might not have that much carbon but definitely at the time when i told you this phase transition occurred the reionization you can do a lot with carbon monoxide hmm. another great uh, L, uh, great species is singly ionized carbon and doubly ionized oxygen so these are these are a bit tricky because these are already ionized substances, but both of them, just like carbon monoxide, are excellent tracers of star formation. If you have star formation, you'll find this. And uh, today, with the ALMA, which is the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array located in Chile, we're finding these routinely at uh, redshift of ten, uh, the time when the universe was a tenth of its present size. We're finding them almost at the time of cosmic dawn. We're definitely finding them well into reionization. So this is why this particular, you know, this particular band represents a wonderful way of complementing our radio efforts in the search for the first stars. And it's going to give us a lot of insights into how these first galaxies and so on form, probably before we make big maps of them with our surveys hmm. and gain a lot of information. Then, of course, we have the optical band, the James Webb Space Telescope launching this year and uh, going to provide deep pencil beam surveys. So these are targeted surveys. These are going to be getting you very small areas, but they're going to be very deep and they're going to kind of, you know, really pinpoint what's uh, the individual galaxies, which is different from what we do in the what we're planning to do in the radio band. So. That's another complementary tool, and it'll go very faint, and it'll go to very high, uh, very high uh, at times, very high redshifts, and very early times. And these are the three, you know, main things in the, uh, you know, electromagnetic spectrum, which is like the light, and it's all its different frequencies and wavelengths. But if you want to talk multi-messenger, you probably want to also think about gravitational waves. Gravitational waves have shown us that they are, you know, the a great uh, tool to kind of complement the electromagnetic observations of uh, stars, neutron stars. We had to be literally struck gold with the gravitational waves in 2017. And uh, gravitational waves for, uh, at these epochs, at, coming from such uh, early times, will tell us about how the first black holes formed, because they're going to be sensitive to the mergers of these very, very massive black holes. And so that's going to be another tool to think about connecting cosmic dawn. So, so now we've talked about sort of the ways that you peer into this period of time. I'd be interested to know what what events I mean, you know, like what are the big mysteries in astronomy that depend on having some insight into this time period? Okay, there are several, uh -huh. so I can give you a, just a glimpse into some of them. The first one is, um, you know, um, this is the final frontier of observational cosmology. There, this is going to represent about 10,000, 100,000 times the amount of information we have till date. So imagine that everything we have till date is a book, like we have all our galaxy surveys, everything that we've, con we've, we've kind of seen so far in cosmology, the CMB, and we take all of this together. This is 10,000 books. It's uh, it's a whole library. And probably if you're very optimistic, you can even go about a thousand times greater than that. So about thousand libraries. So imagine that today we're reading one book and with this entire information space, we're going to have access to 1000 libraries. So this is immense. So this and this 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 is a huge leap in our information content. The sheer number of what people call technical terms modes. So modes are just like how what it, they are a unit of quantifying information. So if you have let's say ten thousand modes today, you are going to have probably a billion with the with all these surveys coming. First, that represents for you a huge amount of precision. So uh, you probably, uh, people know that when uh, you have more information, when you have a larger number of um, data points, you are very, you can be very, very precise in your measurement because your error kind of decreases the more data you have on the same, uh, you know, on the same, um, on the same physical process. 
So this is one of the ways in which we can improve our precision like never before. And there is not going to be any further improvement possible because we have only one universe. Mm -hmm. And this is our way of accessing. Uh, unless, of course, we detect dark matter and have direct access to that in baryons. So that's why my focus has been on the baryonic component, which has been uh, our only tool so far to understand everything else. In baryons, this is it. This is the final frontier. This is the major amount of information. This uh, allows us also to access parts of the universe and scales of the universe. The little sizes which we're going to be sensitive to are unprecedented. We're never going to have access to the kind of, if you take something like the square kilometer array or these very big radio telescopes uh, and so on, which are coming up, um, you're not going to have access, you're going to have access to scales which we never saw before. And why this is important is because these are the kind of scales which will constrain fundamental physics. So uh, effects which take place at very, very large scales, which we may not have been able to access with smaller surveys, are going to become, you know, opened now and going to become possible now. And similarly, when I talked about this evolution of this gas during this reionization and so on, it turns out that physics-wise, you can model it in a very precise way. There are, of course, some astrophysical you know, terms which come into it, but you can, you can make a prediction of how the signal will change across cosmic time just from you know, our standard knowledge of physics and our standard knowledge of astrophysics. So you can make this prediction. And now if you have an observation, you can test it with a huge data set. Right. Now, when you test it, for example, very recently, there was a, 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 a claimed detection of the 21 centimeter. This is the signal which we talk about neutral hydrogen, which was uh, observed at the period of redshift of 17, about when the universe was about 20 times smaller than it is today. And uh, they found something very interesting. They found that probably it represents some kind of cooling of the material more than what you could ga gain from regular astrophysics. So it was, um, therefore, they put down the reason to probably being a different kind of dark matter. So, for example, that different kind of dark matter or a, some sort of um, explanation, which is beyond our standard model of cosmology, our standard model of particle physics, becomes accessible to us because we have the evolution of the material in a way which we couldn't have seen from just one, you know, from one surface like CMB. I mean, it, it, it's kind of fascinating. Like we have on the one hand, we have the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is one of the sort of most detailed images at incredible precision, the temperature variations down to a fraction of a degree. And then we have very detailed surveys of, of the modern universe of the galaxies that are around us, the large scale structures, the walls and voids and stuff that make up the universe today. But there's this just this hole in our understanding where the where the cosmic microwave background ends and the large scale structure of the universe begins, there is just uh, it is unknown terra incognita. And so and so I think there are all these questions like what role did dark matter play? Did it form early on? When did dark energy kick in and start to accelerate the expansion of the universe? How did those first supermassive black holes form? Or was it the galaxies themselves? You know, did stars form like they form today? Or did they were they monsters of 10s of 1000s of times the mass of the sun? So it's it's those kinds of questions, a lot of them are just pivotal. And, and up until this point, astronomers work with these incredible simulations. But, yes. but literally, it's just like cosmic microwave, cosmic microwave background radiation, step yes. two, question mark, question mark, question mark, step three. <laughs> yeah, step three, modern universe, and they simulate to get across that, that missing piece. So will this next generation of research fill in essentially all of that missing knowledge? Absolutely. Uh, we hope that 
you know, when you look at this 21 centimeter of hydrogen, um, and I told you that some of the uh, galaxy surveys and so on have detected it from individual sources, and now we're going, going to go and detect it up to cosmic. One of the key techniques in how you want to do that is by just making maps. Like the cosmic microwave background is a map of the emission, which is uh, in the microwave frequencies, and it's coming towards us from, let's say, from when the universe is a thousand times smaller than it is today. And what this question mark, question mark, question mark period is going to be, in the most optimistic case, filled by huge number of such CMB-like maps. But this time, in 21 centimeter, or in carbon monoxide, or both. I mean, you can cross-correlate these different kinds of maps, but you're going to cover all that intervening question mark space with maps such as the CMB. And those are going to be your sources of information, which, for example, tell you, uh, you know, let's say how the Hubble constant, you have this tension which has come up in the mm -hmm. recent years that it's not going away. Uh, there is, uh, you know, this, and this, this period is in, indeed the same period which is going to fill in an answer to that, hopefully, because if you have a local measurement, you have the CMB, but you don't have in between. If you directly had in between, you know, you have the answer. And uh, that is one of the best ways, uh, uh, one of the best theoretical, uh, you know, questions we can even hope, we can hope to answer even very soon. And similarly for all this exotic, uh, you know, physics and indeed outstanding question, how did the first black holes form? Did they directly collapse and then did they grow and or did they grow very fast? And um, what is the physics? That comes about by this gravitational wave, which I mentioned to you. You want to observe these mergers. And if you combine that understanding with an understanding of the electromagnetic side of things, I mean, it's going to be very easy to probably get very close to understanding the first black holes. Now, you mentioned those major phases early on. You talked about the end of the cosmic microwave background, the dark ages, the epoch of, of reionization, and then kind of the modern time that we have today. Do you think that as we probe that dark age time, there will be new divisions that will come up on events that were happening? You know, I th sort of think about like geological history that we have sort of major geological history. And then we've got these, you know, extinction events and Jurassic and, you know, and so on and so forth. C what kinds of periods do you anticipate that we're going to find filling out the dark ages? Okay, this is a very interesting, it's a great question. And there are already hints of answers to that in the way people model. And as I said, people think about this 21 centimeters. So the first thing is that uh, when we had the evolution of, so let's, let's not worry about stars for the present time. We're talking about the majority of the, incidentally, the majority of the baryonic material. This is something which comes as a surprise even to many physicists that, the baryons, which we know of, and we are talking about for all of this, are 5% of our universe, which most people already know. The mm -hmm. rest of the 95% is dark matter and dark energy today, which is you know unknown uh, in some sense. We have not seen it in the lab and we do not have a physical understanding. But out of this 5%, only about 10% is in stars and stellar systems, which is a very incredible piece of work. Uh, because when you think baryons, you're going to think like, you know, the kind of things we interact with. When we think of normal matter, the kind of things we're made up of, that's, that's just 10%. So we can safely ignore stars throughout the period of all these, um, you know, epochs of reionization and so on if we are interested in the majority of the material. Of course, we need stars for physics, like realizing the universe and so on. But when you think of a census, you essentially have gas all the way at the uh, dark ages and so on. So now when you divide up this period, which is between us and the cosmic, uh, let's say even the cosmic microwave background, people have found that when you model how this gas evolves, which is related to some of the physical processes, there are pretty distinct um, milestones that it goes through. So first milestone is, for example, when if there are a period of, uh, you know, when the first black holes formed, there were things called mini quasars. So quasars are essentially these torches of light from the very early universe. They are believed to be the hearts, very active galaxies, which, uh, you know, emit a lot of very high frequency light. 
Now there were many quasars and those heated up and they had their X-rays, which were, um, you know, uh, propagating into intergalactic space. And the time when this heating happened is one of the milestones. So when the gas was just happily going around and whether it, and there was a time when there was a lot of X-ray and there was a heating epoch. So that is one. The second one is when the actual stars formed and stars are slightly soft sources, like they are not like quasars. Quasars are what are known as hard sources because their uh, frequencies are really high. The, the ma major uh, amount of their light is emitted at very, very strong frequency, very high frequency. However, the stars, they emit at, uh, they're softer because most of their light is emitted in lower frequencies. And those made another kind of milestone, which is known as, uh, well, technically the term is like Lyman alpha coupling, but essentially the, uh, what is uh, the main thing which we want to, uh, we want to kind of say is this is essentially when the first stars interacted with the hydrogen. Okay. So, so when I see Lyman alpha coupling, think first yeah. stars. That's that's a time saver. So, so to speak, because there is always going to be a little bit of, let's say, uncertainty in when exactly was a coupling and when exactly. But indeed, it is something like when you had when the first stars came, that was when Lyman alpha is essentially one of the uh, lines which the stars will emit. And uh, when this gas coupled to that line, you know that stars are around. So that is when the first stars. So in between that, you probably had um, like, you know, some other epochs, which are not, uh, which are, which may be like, if it cooled for any reason, which is what some of the uh, recent studies are suggesting, some exotic dark matter cooled it down, then you would have something. So like that, I definitely, there it will be scope to divide, subdivide this into other, uh, and those divisions will be mostly physics based, like what's happening, what's the dominant thing, which is with the temperature changing. For example, at the heating time, your temperature is going to shoot up mm -hmm. of the whole entire universe. So the universe will spike a fever and then it will cool down and those will be the milestones in the, um, in the intervening time. And so, so you think that we got the black holes before we got the stars? Uh, that it, it, it is possible. Definitely in the kind of the, uh, in the reionization and the kind of literature, you definitely have uh, black holes forming from the stars. You have like, you know, there are different mechanisms, but there is something called direct collapse black hole, which is another complete uh, subject, which is like an entire gas cloud just collapses under its gravity and forms something known as intermediate mass black hole. And th that black hole has a, a mass which is between, you know, stellar mass black holes, which LIGO and so on are detecting, and supermassive black holes, which the laser interferometer, the LISA will detect. So that's why uh, you, are, uh, you, you might have had uh, mini black holes in place. Right. Um, and, and I mean, I know that like you can't get a star when you've got hot gas. You need to have you need to have the cold gas to be able to to come together. And so I guess could you with the gravity of the of the dark matter get these formations that could turn into black holes without that intervening star happen? Because the only way we know how to get a black hole today is with a star. That's true. First. That's true. But those are for the stellar mass black holes. Right. And we kind of know sort of, you know, how. Whereas for the supermassive black hole, as I said, the question is very open. We do not know how they form. There are different mechanisms. And there are definitely ways by which the entire gas cloud directly kind of, you know, collapses. So, yes, that's for sure. So how would we detect that? Like, how would we look in the data and say, oh, there's a black hole forming directly? So, for example, um, you know, one of the things which um, which comes under this multi messenger, and especially at this, these epochs like cosmic dawn and so on, is that uh, you have these um, these pulsar timing arrays, which are detectors of the gravitational waves coming from, um, let's say, um, their frequencies are in nanohertz, which is about a thousand times lower frequency than LISA. LISA is in like millihertz. So then, which is essentially when the universe was 10 times smaller, you would have sensitivity to about a thousand to 10,000 uh, solar mass black holes by looking at LISA. 
And if you're looking at um, these nanohertz frequencies, then you would have sensitivity to, let's say, about a thousand times higher masses. So these are really the ones at the hearts of the galaxy. So for example, like I said, if you have a kind of evolution, if you kind of have a huge number of these measurements which are complementing each other, you can definitely gain insights into how the, the physics you know, is taking place. Now, you mentioned a bunch of, of optical and various versions of electromagnetic spectrum. You talked about the ability to probe into gravitational waves. You didn't mention neutrinos. Do you think neutrinos will play any role, uh, like a background radiation of neutrinos into that multi-messenger astronomy? Absolutely. No, I, I think that's a very nice, uh, um, that's that's definitely one of the things we can do with the multi-messenger uh, studies. Uh, one of the things with the neutrinos have been, um, you know, um, the thing which um, people found about neutrino is that neutrino can't really form a dominant component of the dark matter because it's uh, a bit too hot and uh, it kind of will not allow um, uh, dark matter to collapse on the scales that we see today and it won't allow the structure formation which you know is happening uh, as we see in our universe and the kind of stars and galaxies and so on which we see the distribution would be very very different so neutrinos probably are not you know um, a likely candidate for um, structure formation so to speak for the entire large-scale structure you probably will not expect them to be but um, as a probe i'm sure there are possibilities to use them so so imagine, you know, we're 2030, the square kilometer array has come online, they've finished their first light, they begin this very detailed survey, maybe of a, of a patch of the sky to get some preliminary results. Uh, the data is in front of you. Uh, where, are, what question are you hoping to get some insight into? Where are you jumping to in the data to, to find an answer? It's a very interesting question because, uh, you know, uh, the fact that the data is in front of us is also already a huge leap in our uh, technological capabilities. The data is going to be a huge number of exabytes. And I mean, exabyte was a term I heard about a few months ago. And apparently one exabyte is every word spoken by every human being in the universe till date. <laughs> and yeah. this SK is such a gigantic machine that it's going to detect um, the huge number of exabytes every single second. So that's the kind of data we're looking at. And right. indeed, once we have this data on the table, which is already great, I think the main uh, the main questions would be uh, essentially this. Um, how can we extract fundamental physics as their signature, large scale signatures, signatures of inflation, signatures beyond our standard cosmological model in dark matter and uh, you know at the very early times signatures of tension signatures of um, what, uh, let's say the hubble uh, tension whether you have um, a, 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 a sort of understanding of it which is different you get a different number compared to what you see from cmb and what you see from the local universe those would be really the heart of, um, you know, the fundamental physics which you can do with this data. On the astrophysical side, uh, I think the biggest signatures would be signature would be how did reionization happen, which is the final frontier of astrophysics. How did it happen? Who? What were the sources? And when? Um, the entire timeline is very exciting. Like I told you, this whole evolution of this gas we do not know what kind of time it took we do not know whether it started at redshift 15 and ended at redshift 5 whether it started at 10 and it's and knowing that is going to be a quantum leap in our understanding of galaxy evolution so these are the two major you know prongs which we're hoping to get solved uh, with SK. well let's and, talk about uh, a couple, other... couple of those so for example dark matter at this mm -hmm. point you know, astronomers still mildly argue about whether dark matter is a particle or whether it's just us not understanding gravity at the at the largest scales. Although I think the the evidence is pretty overwhelming that it is some kind of particle. I can't imagine that that these kinds of surveys would tell us what particle it is, but it would give us more at least more clues to look at, right? 
Indeed. Um, for example, we recently wrote a paper, which again I summarize uh, here, which is led by a student in Göttingen, where what he was doing was looking at um, how this, uh, for example, one of the prime candidates for a dark matter, uh, dark matter particle is known as an axion. An axion gets its name from the American detergent, uh, the axion. Uh, it's actually one of the proposed solutions to clean up one of the long-standing problems, uh, you know, in particle physics. So it, it, it was it came because of that, but its uses are, f are huge. There are lots of uh, interesting applications if Axion existed. So Axion uh, as a component of dark matter has been ex investigated by several people. And uh, being one of the prime candidates, there's a lot of observations which already put bounds on how much of the dark matter can be composed of Axions. And with the square kilometer array and with this kind of huge information service, we can do this to a much more precise degree. And we found that we can even, you know, sort of constrain the masses and abundances of the axions across cosmic time for such a dark matter candidate to be viable. So that's definitely one of these and uh, different other kinds of dark matter like for example what i was telling you about this um, this kind of signal which we detected which uh, was supposed to be coming from when the universe was about 20 times uh, smaller is uh, reminiscent of uh, i mean is kind of consistent with another component of dark matter so what is known as milli charged dark matter and the, the different other kinds of dark matter which uh, which can cause it and uh, detecting a huge number of such kind of signals will pin down uh, i'm pretty sure it would pin down a huge number of theories of dark matter at least constrain them to a place where we are very sure about uh, one or a couple or three or four theories something like that <laughs> um like i wonder how you would be able to kind of like replicate in the lab the kinds of observations. But at the very least, you would be able to take a huge chunk of the papers that have been proposed suggesting dark matter or particles of various masses or sizes or whatever energies and be able to to go and sort of show experimentally that 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 can't be possible based on the observations that you make. So at least being able to winnow down. Huge. Yeah, we yeah. can rule out a lot of it. And that is very, very valuable because at the moment we probably don't have enough information to rule out. It's called parameter space. Like, you know, you have a para you have these two parameters which are like the properties and you can rule out a huge amount of it and you can go out there and get uh, uh, and then that would really inform probably it's a complementary tool it'll work hand in hand with efforts in the laboratories to really pin down what the particle is yeah yeah and and so uh, let's talk about this idea of the the hubble tension which others call the crisis in cosmology um just this measurement of the expansion rate of the universe at the cosmic microwave background and uh, that's different than the expansion rate that's measured more more recently so what again what kinds of observations do you think you would make during the dark ages during this period that would give you some kind of insight exactly what people have done for the CMP, but this time in baryonic emission. You do maps of, like I said, very large scale maps covering huge amount of area. And you have just like, you know, the CMB, the most important quantity, which gets you all this information and so on is known as a power spectrum. So it's just telling you the strength of the, or the power of the, the radiation in different um, in different frequencies or in different wavelengths. And essentially the same thing you can do, for example, and at different scales also. The same thing you can do um, for this 21 centimeter or this kind of radiation, you will get huge number of power spectra. And this power spectrum is a very useful cosmological tool, as you can already see from the CMB. And it's, it, and you having these, this plethora of power spectra is going to be, you know, uh, is going to pin down the Hubble, uh, you will get measurements of the Hubble constant at different, at different times. And then you can see how it's evolving. So that's one of the one of the ways in which probably we can uh, go towards uh, reconciling these two. These I, two. And I mean, like, you know, the proposed answers right now are 
someone made a mistake in their measurement, which still feels like it's the most likely result, even though the I know the error bars of the measurements don't overlap, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't something fundamental to the way you measure the distance of a type one, a supernova that doesn't, you know, that may not may not match up. And so if you saw, say, the expansion rate perfectly match, say, the cosmic microwave background all the way through the dark age, then that would tell you that that's the right measurement after all or that some expansion kicked in some change. So do you do you have a, you know, place your bets, I guess is what I'm saying. If you were to if you were to guess, do you think it's an error in measurement? Or do you think there's something some there are some new physics going on in that period? Yeah, well, Occam's razor tells you that probably you don't want to have more physics and more parameters. You want to have, you know, um, kind of, you want to do everything with the least amount of parameters possible. But uh, I would probably say that the question right now is very much open. And um, we are on the brink of being able to answer that. So I think the answer definitely lies, uh, lies in the data. And um, if it's new physics, uh, there is... And what is, what is very nice about the fact that there's going to be all this different data is that if there is new physics, then that new physics will manifest itself in a huge number of other observations other than this H, this Hubble. So for example, as I said, you're going to already have maps of the 21 centimeter. You might have maps of carbon monoxide and all other things. And whatever physics is causing, let's say, if a certain new physical process is proposed, that has to be consistent with all this extra information. That's the huge power of having all this extra information. So that would, uh, you know, in that sense, we are in a much more stronger place when we have this intervening question mark, question mark filled up. Because new physics cannot just be a one-off, it has to satisfy everything. We'll finally be in a place where we have more observations than probably physical parameters, which is a great place to be. Right. Yeah, it would be a really good place. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you think about like the number of, of papers out there that are trying to make a guess exactly. on what dark matter, for example, is, you'll finally have more observations than estimates. You'll have for, more observations yeah. than your predictions. Yeah, and yeah. that's uh, that, that, that's that's uh, once, in, once in a universe's lifetime almost, right? We're never, we've never seen that happen, and uh, we're hopefully on the brink of seeing it. And and like when I talk about the square kilometer array, it almost sounds like, like science fiction, um, the capabilities of, of what it's going to have. I mean, one of the interesting things that I talk about, people are always interested about aliens and things like that. And like, you could detect air traffic control on Earth from about 100 light, something even better. So let's say that the square kilometer has come in, it's done a great job, Nobel Prize is all around. But now people are starting to imagine what comes next. What okay. kind of a what kind of an instrument can you imagine would would fill in the missing pieces that are that remain from the square kilometer array and some of these other big surveys? Well, um, if you're talking about the electromagnetic band, I think uh, definitely in the radio, it's the, it's the biggest radio telescope that's ever going to ever built. And, uh, you know, probably for several years to come, it'll be the biggest radio telescope there is. Um, I think the thing which would very well complement that is um, searches in the gravitational wave regime, what we talked about the LISA and those kind of uh, those kind of facilities, which are a little bit beyond the square kilometer array in terms of their first um, first light, let's say in the terms of their first um, observations. And uh, this is because uh, with SK, we can do a lot of large scale stuff, we can do this huge amount of this information, this 21 centimeter and all this. Whereas with kind of things like LISA and, uh, you know, gravitational wave searches, we can do um, the physics of extremes. We can do physics of the first black holes. We can do, uh, you know, uh, the formation that which we talked about. That, those, that kind of science, which is really the ideal complement to a wide survey that's just going to give us huge amount of cosmological information. So that kind of survey can potentially test a quantum theory of gravity, which is our holy grail, which is right. really the final frontier of physics, it, it, uh, physics even. So that is, uh, that is probably uh, 
given both of these efforts both bearing fruit, it's um, that's probably going to get us to our closest uh, shot at quantum gravity. Yeah. Now you say that it's like the biggest instrument that we'll ever build, but but I mean it's just a, it, it's it's just going to be a stepping stone to the next one. Maybe it'll be a space based one. Maybe it's going to be an interferometer with with one series of radio telescopes on one side of the Earth's orbit and another series on the other side of the Earth's orbit and lots of telescopes in between. I mean, you yeah. know, don't let He's your space, don't yeah. let your imagination, you know, be constrained here. But you brought on, I think, a really interesting point. I think one sort of the last one we'll be able to talk to is that even if these incredible tech, you know, telescopes Not reveal every phase in between the cosmic microwave background and the modern universe that we see today, we are left with this gigantic unknown, which is how do we bring together gravity and, and, and electromagnetism? Do you think that with these surveys, we'll get an answer to that? Or is that going to take a more fundamental search? You know, the, the, cosmic microwave background is this wall that we can't peer at through electromagnetics, we can theoretically go beyond with gravitational waves. Where do you think we get that answer? It's a great question. Uh, my personal take on this is that um, I did spend some time working on the cosmological pro constant problem and, uh, and uh, from a paradigm known as the emergent gravity paradigm. And there are all these approaches to think about the uh, the nature of gravity and quantum gravity and related to cosmological constant problem and these really fundamental questions. I think that the major breakthrough will be theoretical because you're going to have, uh, you know, think our entire idea of gravity. But to test that theory, we're going to need all the data which we can get. And that is what provide us. So we need a combination of to be sort of um, constrained or to be tested by the best observations in multi messenger. Yeah, it will be it'll be an amazing day when we get that answer, you know, Einstein spent the rest of his life searching for this way to bring these these forces Einstein together. Yeah. yeah, and hopefully within our lifetime, we will finally see an, an answer to it thanks to monster telescopes. Right. And uh, coupled to a great theoretical breakthrough. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Um, well, uh, Dr. Padmarabhan, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. If people want to follow your work, follow your research, where should they go? I have a web personal website, which is uh, hosted by the University of Geneva. And, uh, uh, and uh, in that there is my email and so on. And uh, yeah, that's probably the best. Way. Yeah, so just read your research. Perfect. You're not on the social medias, so. I am not on the social that's, media. that's for the best. I highly, I, I, you know, more time researching, less time getting sucked into Twitter drama. So I think that's, that's the best way to go. Uh, well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Really appreciate it. Good luck with your research. And if you do crack any of those mysteries, please let us know. Wonderful to talk to you. Thank you so much for the time. It's All a right. Great, great experience. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.